course, the seminar, the question about Smith Wigglesworth. Do you have the reference where the prophetic word for Australia through Smith Wigglesworth? Yes, I will bring that with me tomorrow. It's actually a book that I purchased here. <laughs> so, it's, um, it's by a man named Cole Stringer. String? Yeah, about Wigglesworth. It's that book. So it's in the back of that. Of course, there is other material also. Uh, you're probably aware of the prophecy he gave to uh, David Duplessis about the charismatic renewal that would start. And I have been in the, I'm working with the AFM, the Apostolic Faith Mission. Dr. Lake started there in 1908. And I've had access to all their archives and been pulling material out. And a lot of that we're actually going to be publishing. But um, it's some, some neat stuff. Um, <clears throat> really, all it takes is we just got to get back to our roots. You know? Sooner or later, you'll get tired of reading about those old guys and you'll start doing stuff worth writing about. Amen? <clears throat> I, I decided, now I still read books about Wigglesworth and Lake and different people, but I would rather live a life worth writing about than to read about a life that was worth writing about. Amen? Okay, uh, let's see here. We're just going to answer this real quick, and I'm going to show you something, and then we'll get right into the teaching. But if you want, let's see here. Yeah, 1 Corinthians. We'll go to 1 Corinthians very quickly. <clears throat> we don't cover this specifically, even though we get very close. As, and the reason I'm touching this is because this is not a seminar about gifts, right? So that's why I'm going to answer a question about gifts. So, in, let's see here, where am I at? <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, it says, Brother Curry, thanks for your teaching. I have seen more healing than ever before. Good. How do I increase my effectiveness in releasing power? Okay, we'll talk about that some. How do you explain 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, especially verses 9 and 11? All right, so we're going to look at that first. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or chapter 12, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4. Uh, actually, we're going to go back to verse 1. Might as well start there. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now first off, notice, if your Bible's a good Bible, which means it's accurate. Well, there's some out there that aren't accurate, so you have to be specific. Uh, you'll notice that the word gifts is not in the original Greek. It's in italics, which means it's not in the Greek. So Paul didn't write and say, now concerning spiritual gifts. He wrote literally and said, now concerning spirituals. Talking about spiritual activities, right? Don't use the word gift unless you see the word gift there. Okay? Now, <clears throat> verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts. Right? So this is the first time where the word gift is actually used. It says there are diversities of gifts. Now, we know that there are in this chapter, there are nine gifts. I was blessed in that, as I said, I spent several years under Dr. Lester Sumrall, who is generally accepted as the world's foremost authority on the gifts of the Spirit. So I had a lot of time to talk and go over these things. <clears throat> so that's where a lot of my understanding comes from, along with the practice of what we've been doing and seeing how they work. So he says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Now, you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine gifts listed there. People have them broken down into three groups of three. But I want to show you even more so. First off, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Verse 5, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Verse 6, and there are diversities of operations. So even though you have nine gifts, you take the nine and then you can also multiply them by another three because each of the nine can be operated in different diversities, in differences of administrations, how they're administered, and diversities of operations of actually how you operate in them. All right? Now, again, this isn't a seminar on gifts. If it, see, if, because it goes on down, and it says, this is where I want to get you to, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit. So what we're talking about when you mention gifts, don't think of gifts as a gift. Right? Each gift is a gift 
to you for someone else, first off. It's not a gift to you, it's for other people, all right? Now, number two is that the gift is the manifestation of the Spirit. A gift is not a gift like a thing. It is how the Spirit manifests himself. You understand? So, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now notice it doesn't say the gift of the word of wisdom, even though we use that term and it's not necessarily wrong, but it doesn't say it. So the Spirit manifests himself through a word of wisdom. Okay? Usually this is where prophetic word comes out. Something, uh, the gift of prophecy has nothing to do with foretelling. You understand? The gift of prophecy doesn't tell you something that's going to happen. That we call that prophecy, but actually it's the word of wisdom technically is usually where it has something to do with something that's going to happen in the future. Okay? Prophecy is specific. It, is, it comforts, it exhorts, and it edifies. Right? It does not foretell. Right? Okay. Again. All right. I'm not doing a seminar on gifts. Don't have time. But I'm just trying to nail some of these things down for you real quick. Okay? And to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. That word, word of knowledge, is the logos. Right? It's a word. It's not a rhema. Right? And we'll talk about that later on. But it is a specific word. It is a word of God's knowledge. It's not everything God knows. It's a specific thing that you could not know any other way but by the Spirit. Okay? Now, uh, by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing. And in King James it says healing, but in the Greek both words are plural. Gifts of healings. Right? It's not gifts of healing. It's gifts of healings. Dr. Sumrall used to say that based on his experience and his study of the word, that there were probably as many gifts of healings as there were problems that needed to be healed. In other words, see, our problem is we think in terms of, well, he has a gift of healing for cancer. Well, not really, right? In other words, every time a healing manifests, it is a gift to that person of the manifestation of the Spirit through you to that person. You understand that? So every time, you can have a whole lot of um, you know, fireworks, firecrackers, okay? And it's just sitting there. But every time an explosion goes off, that's, that is a, an event that happens that can only happen once. Right? can't happen again right now you take the same but you say what well, it could happen again because there's another firecracker no not with that one right that was used up right then okay that's the way gifts operate right so if you have a you can have a gift of healing and it but it will be a gift for that moment right and when it's over that that gift is gone why because that's a manifest see get away from gifts Think in terms of manifestations of the Spirit. If you came to me and said, or let's say I was walking through here and I looked at you and I said, oh, um, here, I just want to give you $5. Okay? And I saw another person, I said, oh, I got a book I want to give you. And then another person said, oh, you know, uh, here, you know, do you have an ink pen that I could use? Oh, yeah, here you go. Now, you wouldn't think of those, I mean, we might call those gifts, but really each one would meet a need you had and in actuality, the gift isn't what's important. It's that each one was a manifestation of my willingness to meet your need. You get it? That's what gifts are. They are merely manifestations of the Spirit to show you God's willingness to meet your need. So don't think in terms of, I have this gift, I have that gift, I have this. It, that, that means, it, the problem with that is, when you meet someone that doesn't need your gift, but they need something else, you won't help them. You'll send them to somebody that's got that other gift. And in reality, the Bible says to give to any man that asks you. So you ought to be able to help anybody regardless of what they need. Why? Because it's not about you. It is you representing Jesus who is going to meet all their needs. Amen? Amen? So, okay. Now, this said especially verses 9 and 11. So we're pretty much there. 
uh, and then verse 11. Yeah. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now that word severally doesn't mean several like many. It means separately. In other words, it is divided out as he wills. Now that word as he wills means literally as it is his constant desire. It doesn't mean he does it when he feels like it. It's similar to when the man came to Jesus and he said, Lord, uh, I know you can heal me if you will, if thou wilt, that you can make me clean. Remember the leper, was it Matthew 8? The leper came down and said, Lord, if you can make me clean if you will, if thou wilt. And Jesus said, I will be thou clean. He wasn't saying, I'm going to do it. That's, that's, you look up that word, we'll talk about this a little later on, but you look up that word will, and it's the Greek word, othello, and it means literally, it is my desire well, I've got to give you the whole thing. Actually, what it means is, it is, in the Greek, there are tenses, and there are various ways of writing a word that can put a paragraph in one word. Okay? So when he said, I will, he wasn't just saying, I'm going to do it. He was saying, it is my will, it is my desire, it is who I am, it's who, it is an expression of my nature. Now, also the tense of the word, especially there, is, is in the present tense, which means it's ongoing and it's, it's now and always. So in other words, he's not just saying, I'm going to do it now. He's saying, I am always willing. I'm always wanting to do it because it is my nature to heal. All that's in that one little word, I will. Every bit of it. So when you start to realize this, when he says he, he does this severally as he will, he's not just saying he will do it when he wants to. It's, he's saying he will do it because he is always willing to, to give out. Right? So he is always willing to meet the need. Right? We were talking about this earlier. There, there's a couple of things here, and you've got some great questions, but I have to be careful because we'll, we'll get off <laughs> into just new creation stuff and not stick to the DHD. Now, some of the things to remember in ministering is that when you start, when you say, well, let me, there is one question here I wanted to. Yeah, okay. It says, all believers are, are of the opinion that we have to put up with the vexations of the devil. Okay, I don't know what believers you're hanging out with. <laughs> but I wouldn't hang out with them. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, uh, if we get a chance and I have the time, I will show you. I can give you scriptures uh, Ephesians, Peter, let me think what else, and 1 John. Yeah. <clears throat> Peter says, if you do these things, you will never fall. If you add to your faith virtue, add to your knowledge, add, he says, you will never fall. He says, you will never be barren or unfruitful. In any good work, he says, and you will never fall. That right there is a promise to tell you, if you don't want to fall, you do those things. So if you fall, it's because you haven't done those things. Right? Now, in Peter, he says that by these precious promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. And he goes on to actually tell you at one point, he, he well, actually it kind of goes back to what I was just telling you, though. He said that if you do these things, you can always stand and you'll never have to fall. Then you go over to Ephesians in chapter 6 and it says, he goes through the, the armor. Everybody knows about the armor, right? And he talks about the different types of armor. But he says at one place it says, above all, taking up the shield of faith, right? Now we know that salvation is important, heaven is salvation, but it says above all, taking up the shield of faith. So in other words, he's already mentioned all the other things and he comes back and says, yeah, all that's good, it's important, but... Above all, take up the shield of faith, whereby you will, shall, be able to quench all, right, the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, what does that tell you? If you take up your shield of faith, no fiery dart ever has to touch you. Do you understand? It should never touch you. Your shield of faith, matter of fact, if you go back and do a little research historical, it's kind of neat, because most of the shields back then were made out of wood. 
and they would talk about these fiery darts, talks about taking up the shield of faith, and they were talking about putting up a wooden shield, and it says that by this wooden shield, when you put up your wooden shield, this fiery dart would come into it, but the, this shield would put out the fiery dart. Well, how many of you know that fire burns wood? <laughs> but the night before the battle, they used to put their shields in water. They would soak them. So that the next day, now the, sh the shields would be heavier, but whenever the fiery darts would hit the shield, the water in the shield would put the fiery dart out. Right? Now, the key for that, because we know that that shield is a shield of faith, but how do you get faith? It's by hearing the what? The word. By the washing of the water of the word, and by soaking in the word, you get to a place where your shield will always put out every fiery dart, so nothing can ever touch you. Do you understand that? I'm talking about a place... You can, I'm going to give you three scriptures here. The other ones are over in 1 John. And he says that, in 1 John, he says that if you, you have this, this uh, belief in you, okay, that, you, that you're looking for the coming of Jesus, that you will purify yourself. Now, how many of you know that we know that God will keep whatever you commit to him? It, you heard that scripture, right? God keeps whatever you commit to him. Well, the Bible also says, and this amazing thing, it says that if you have this hope in you, you keep yourself. You hear that? You keep yourself. Now we know that God keeps you, but he says that if you have this hope in you and you purify, purify yourself, that you will keep yourself. And so by you keeping yourself, you take up your shield of faith, and that by all of the, well, the three scriptures I just gave you, in 1 John, Peter, and then in Ephesians, it tells you how you can live without ever falling, how you can live where the enemy can never touch you, right? Matter of fact, that's what it says in 1 John. I should have finished quoting it. It says, you keep your, it says he keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Now, how many of you want to live in a place where the wicked one never touches you? That's where you're supposed to live. See, that's not some high and lofty place to get. That should be where you live. Amen? Amen? You should not live under the fear that if you're going to do something for God, the enemy's going to come in and always be beating up on you. But yet, how many times we, well, I know I'm, I must be doing something right because all hell's come against me. Okay, never use the devil as a cue or a clue to whether you're doing right or not. Amen? This tells you whether you're doing right or not. You don't need the devil <laughs> to let you know. Amen? So you can keep yourself and the wicked one can touch you not. You can live in a place where sickness and disease and sin cannot touch you. Amen? Now, you know, people say, well, the Bible says, so if any man says that he you know, doesn't sin, that he has not sinned, then, you know, he's, then he's, uh, he's a liar. Truth's not in him. Uh, okay, that's not what that's talking about. Because he also said, I write to you so that you sin not. But if you sin, not when you sin, if. Sin is a choice. You understand? See, you really started thinking about this, and we'll talk about this too. We'll tie this together. It's pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> when you start to tie sin and sickness together, we've done that a lot in the church, and they're not totally connected, but they were both taken care of at the same time. But it's amazing because you look at sickness, and we say, well, I can't help but be sick. I mean, I'm not trying to get sick, but it could, okay. But yet, we know we don't have to get into sin. Right? Yeah. You don't have to walk in sin. You're not supposed to walk in sin. Sin should not have dominion over you. Right? And you should live free from it. He came to save us from our sins. Not in our sins, from our sins. And so, you don't just, people say, well, I fell into sin. No, you didn't fall into nothing. You walked into it. Right? You didn't fall in. You knew what you were doing. That's what made it sin, basically. So you have to realize that you don't have to be in sin and you don't have to be sick. And until you hate both, you'll never get out of either. Right? So you have to hate sickness. You have to hate sin. You have to hate disease. You have to hate everything. Why? Because this is the message. This is what John said. He said, this is the message that you heard from us from the beginning. That God is light and in him there is no darkness. But yet most of the church believes that God has some darkness in him because he has some hidden will that he wants you to be sick sometime to teach you something. Well, if you're going to believe that, 
Jesus paid for your sin at the same time he paid for your sickness. If he wants you to be sick sometimes to prove something, then he also wants you to live in sin. I don't think there's anybody here who wants to go that far. Right? So you have to hate it. Now, just very quickly, uh, we will talk about more of this as we go on. It says what to do to stir up. How do we know when we're stirred up? Okay, there's two other things that I will mention to you. One is, there's stirring up and there's building up. Okay? You stir up the gift that is in you. Now, that's not talking about one of the nine gifts. Anytime, it's talk, anytime it says the gift, it didn't, he didn't say stir up a gift in you. He said stir up the gift in you. And anytime it says the gift, it always refers to the gift of the Holy Ghost. So who, what you're stirring up is not a gift. It is the gift of the Holy Ghost that you have in you, right? Now, you stir up, and you can do that by several ways. One is praying in tongues. That's a good one. Another is reading the Word. Another one is preaching the Word. You can't generally, <laughs> I hope you can't preach without getting stirred up, right? Because believe me, if you can preach without getting stirred up, ain't nobody you're preaching to getting stirred up, <laughs> okay? Okay? That's what John Wesley used to say. And they said, how, how do you attract such large crowds? He said, I just set myself on fire and they come watch me burn. <laughs> All right? So, but we need to realize you can stir yourself up, speaking to yourself. Well, actually what it says too is that he says also you must build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. All right? Now, so you can build yourself. There's building up and there's stirring up. Stirring up is for an emergency it's for a crisis. It's for a now. Building up is for maintenance. You should not have to get stirred up if you're built up. Right? Because when, when you get built up, it should be at this level. Right? And then, now let's say, you, let's say you're here. Then, and there's a problem that comes along. Then you have to get stirred up. And the stirring up goes beyond what you're built up to get the problem solved. But then usually it dies back down because you're here. And so... But see, imagine if you could live built up to the point where you could never tell when you got stirred up. Amen? Now, what we call this, we call this revival. When you get stirred up beyond what you're built up, we call that revival. Right? That's not. What that is, is that's revealing how backslid you were. Right? I like William Booth. He said, I'm not looking for a move of God. I am a move of God. Hallelujah. Amen? We don't need to get... I, I'm telling you, I'm not looking for revival. I am revival. I live revived. I stay revived. Let me tell you, the best thing you'll ever do is take responsibility for people. Because the minute you start taking responsibility for people, you'll realize you can't afford an off day. You can't afford to wake up cold to God. You can't live just any way you want to live. Well, I'll put it this way. I am living the way I want to live. Right? I'm drinking all the alcohol I want to drink. Smoking all the dope I want to smoke. Right? And you know what that means? I ain't drinking and I ain't smoking. Why? Because I don't want to. I found something way better. Right? Now, I have to say that by faith because I've never drank, I've never tasted alcohol, and I've never smoked dope. So I don't know. But I do know this, that I'm living the way I want to. See, the, one of the, uh, you know, a while back I said I was going to start doing this at meetings. In the beginning, the first, f f first few sessions, basically just make sure everybody here is saved. Right? Because it, it doesn't do you any good to learn how to heal the sick if you ain't saved. Right? You don't want to get all fired up and go out and watch people, you know, get healed, and then you go to hell. Right? So at some point, we just got to make sure everybody's saved. Now, the problem, if you go back and study some of these early things, <clears throat> in the early days, there was this aspect, something called sanctification, which meant separation from sin to holiness. Now, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about, you know, preaching how to dress and all that kind of stuff. What I'm saying is that in the early days, when people got saved the next step for them was what they called sanctification. And they would get down on the altar and they would pray until the desire to sin was broken in them. And see, that's something we don't know about anymore. 
See, now we've been taught, well, that desire will always be there and it'll continue to be there and you just got to resist and usually fall and then get back up and keep on going. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Right? Now, how many of you want to go buy a car and find out that the title has a lien on it? You don't want to buy a car with a lien on it, do you? What makes you think God does? God doesn't want you with a lien on it. You understand? He wants you with a clean title. He didn't want the devil to come calling on you anytime and say, wait a minute, I got a piece of him. You understand? He wants you to be free. You need to be able to stand before God and before man and be able to say, take your best shot, devil. You got nothing in me. The wicked one comes and touches me not. Do you understand that? Why? Because you got nothing. Why? Because I'm full of God. There's no room in here for the other. Amen? But to do that, you got to learn to hate them. You got to learn to hate sin. You got to learn to hate sickness. Now, during the time we had a break here, I was talking to somebody, and they had metal in their neck. I was going to show them this. I brought these this time. I don't know where they take. You see that? Everybody see that? Can you kind of see that? Okay, that that's actually on a music stand. That black behind us, a music stand. All that silver stuff there. That's three pounds of surgical metal. Right? That was in a person's back and spine. They came into a healing service, laid hands on them, prayed for them. They went home, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. This was lying in their bed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. They didn't know how it got there, but the doctor that put it there, they went and got checked, and the doctor that put it there said, I, I can't explain it, but that's the metal I put in you, and now it's, it was lying in their bed. Amen. So God took it out. Amen? So, whoever that was that I prayed for your neck with the metal to come out, I fully expect for, to, for it to be lying in your bed or somewhere, right? So just don't be surprised. Now, very quick here. Sure. Oh, yeah, I just found this. This was the first time I ever taught a DHT. This was in a home. This was in Asheville, North Carolina. We, we preached in three different homes over... A, course of a week, uh, had 200 people there, had to pray for all of them, had 40 terminal cancer patients, all 40 were healed, out of the 200, we don't know of any that were not healed, amen, but that was the first time we taught it, that was 10 years ago this year, I guess, now, the other thing is, as we talk about, y'all may have heard me talk about my daughter, um, this is her headstone, Right? This is a grave that I have in McKinney, Texas where my daughter died and we buried her there. And so, you know, that gives you all the dates and everything, but I just thought I'd bring that. Now, when we got started, <clears throat> we, you know, I hadn't given you a lot of background and everything yet, but I will at some point, okay? But we, um, in 1978, what kind of got us started, because I know if I was you, if you've never heard me before, I'd want to know why I should listen to me, right? And so, first off, if I didn't get results, I wouldn't expect you to listen to me. And so, the only reason I would listen is because I get results, amen? And, and the beauty of it is, now see, if, if I got results and everybody listening to me didn't, then obviously it would be an anointing or a gift. But the fact is, the people we train get the same results, and, and in some cases, better results. Amen? Well, that means that we're not basing this off of a gift. We're basing this off of the Word of God. We're basing this mainly off of Mark 16, of what believers do. Believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. All right. Now, I do have to tell you, there's two things to that. Number one, that does not guarantee instantaneous, miraculous healing. All right? Now, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm not saying you shouldn't believe for it. Whenever we minister, we always believe for the instant right then, and we go for it right then, right? But Mark 16 does not say that you'll lay hands on the sick and they will be instantly healed. It says they shall recover. The problem is most Christians, when they don't see instantaneous results, they quit, they back off, they decide it didn't work, and then the people don't recover because the person that's supposed to be believing stops. Do you understand? So the key to this, number one, is 
finding out what the word says, and then you don't stop. You keep pushing, you don't stop, you don't back off, you don't settle for anything other than the results you're going after. Amen? Perseverance, that's all it takes. Now, but the, the beauty of it is, now remember, when we talk about healing, the I-N-G on the end means a process. Healing, right? If you're running, it means you're in the process of run. Right? Healing means a process. Now, the process can be short or it can be long. What determines that really is two things. Number one, it is the amount of faith and virtue. Now, virtue doesn't mean your goodness. Okay? It's the virtue the Bible talks about. Power. Dunamis. Right? Explosive, supernatural, miraculous power of God. To the degree that those two, faith and the, the miraculous power of God are mixed together to that degree you see the results now we'll go along in this and I'll give you a lot more details in it but in 1978 my daughter was born uh, and again I'm going to have to give you the other details about how we came into the ministry and how John J. Lake Ministries was given to us and all that but I, I also want to remind you that I'm not here in the name of John G. Lake do you understand that he was a man He's a man of God. He did some good things at the same time. He was a man. He didn't hang on a cross, right? So we're not here in his name. We're here in the name of Jesus. He's the only person that's special. Do you understand? None of us are special, only Jesus. But he lives in us. Amen? Now, <clears throat> when, we, um, when my daughter was born, we were, I, I just, I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit because i got time here, so I'm, I'm doing good. Whenever, the way all this come about is that I was actually born April 1st, 1959. Okay, that makes me 51. So don't, so you're not wasting any time trying to figure out how old I am, I'll just tell you, right? You'll miss what I'm saying, wait, trying to figure it out. I'm 51 this year. And when I was born, uh, I was at 17 months old my, well, when I was born. My mom was very young. My, uh, she was 16, and my dad was 17. I'm an only child. She wasn't supposed to be able to have children, and after I was born, they never had any more. Well, in, on September 16, 1960, I was 17 months old, and we were at a family reunion, and my father went out to get in the car to go somewhere, and he didn't see me. We're at this reunion in 17 months. I was walking. And with a lot of people around, nobody is really watching you. You know, I mean, somewhat. Well, I snuck out, went out to get in the car, and he didn't see me. And so as I got around the back of the car, he backed out over me and hit me with the car. Well, what it did was it pulled me up into the wheel well inside the car or in the, underneath the car. It grabbed my hair on this side, grabbed my ear, and matter of fact, you can still see it today, but it ripped this ear completely off. My scalp was ripped from this side to the other ear, and all of the scalp from the front or from the middle down was pulled down to my eyes like a mask. Uh, my dad heard that he hit something, got out, looked under the car, and I was lying still. He thought I was dead. He ran back into the house yelling, I've killed our baby, I've killed our baby. All the family piled out to see what was going on. My grandfather picked me up, by this time, apparently, I was moving. He picked me up, picked up my ear, put me in his truck, and took me to a hospital, which was only a couple of blocks away. When they got me there, it was a small Texas town. Uh, everybody knew everybody, pretty much. And when they got me there, the doctor told my parents, just get ready. He's going to die. There's too much damage. He's going to die. So he went in to do some work. My mom went to pray, and she was actually, at that time, the only Pentecostal there. Not that she was the only one praying, but I'm saying she was Pentecostal. And she got to praying, and she said, God, we dedicate him to you. If you'll let him live, I will raise him for you. I'll train him for you. After about an hour and a half or so, the doctor came back out. He took a break and came out and said, uh, well, it looks like he might actually live. But if he does, he'll be a vegetable all, all of his life. He'll never be able to dress himself, take care of himself, feed himself, anything. You'll have to do it. He went back in to do some more surgery, and my mom went back to praying. I said, God, that's not good enough. If you're going to let him live, let him be normal. And as I always tell everybody, that is still open for debate. Okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> but then she went back to praying, 
And after about another hour and a half, he had to come back out again for another break. And he said, you know, we can't really find any signs of brain damage yet. It's too early to tell. But even if there's not any brain damage, he will never have any hearing in his right ear, and he will never have any hair. And so he went back in. My mom went back to praying. <clears throat> Today I have plenty of hair. This is about as short as it's been. I've got perfect hearing in my right ear. I've got one in both ears, but specifically the right one. And I have a decent IQ uh, that when the Air Force, when I went into the military, they tested me and I actually had to take the test twice because they thought I cheated on it. And so, they, and I actually uh, got to go into the field that I wanted to go into at that time, which was security police, and then I went into pararescue and got to, to the field that I wanted to go into. But anyway, after that, after I was hit by the car, only child, my parents didn't, um, didn't send me to school right away, and I was kind of the pet of the family. Everybody always real careful with me. Uh, it took 172 stitches to put me back together. And they put the ear back on. You can still see the scar and all that back there. And so they were always real careful with me. And so my mom kept me at home. My dad worked nights. And my mom taught me how to read using the King James Bible. And at first, she would read me to sleep. And then she taught me how to read the Bible. And then she would have me read it to her. And eventually, I was reading her to sleep. So... <laughs> And we were, we were laughing not too long ago. I told her, I said, Mom, I'm still reading people to sleep in the Bible. <laughs> so, yeah, so. But it was uh, over the years, I didn't know it at the time, but when, what you read, you remember, basically. And then what you write down, you remember even more. And so all those years, God was having my mom put the scriptures in me, which later years, I wouldn't even know it, but scriptures that I didn't even know were in the Bible would just start coming out. And so... Whenever I turned uh, nine, I went across the street at our house. We had a little house, and across the street was a church, a little Nazarene church. My parents were both working, and I went over, and when the pastor gave the altar call, I went forward and gave my life to Christ. Then I knew God was with me. I'd, I'd known he'd been with me all my life. He'd protected me many, many times. But then when I turned 17, I went in the military, and I was in there under guaranteed enlistment. I was there for some time. Started reading my Bible again, uh, you know, really studying it, and started realizing that God was calling me to preach, which was not in the plans, really. I mean, that was not my goal. I was going to be, I was going to go into be a law enforcement officer. Uh, I'm a certified corrections officer for the state of Texas. I've worked in the prisons there, and so I was. That was my. That's where I was headed, and then I went into pararescue, which is uh, Air Force Special Operations, and. My life was pretty well planned. And God said, you were dedicated to me when you were 17 months old, and I want you. And I said, well, I'm under guaranteed enlistment. I can't get out. I said, you get me out, and I'll go preach. Well, 10 days later, <laughs> they came down and said, we have too many people in this field. You can either transfer to this field, or you can take an honorable discharge and get out with full benefits. I said, cut my papers, I'm gone. So I got out. Now, at this time, I was still basically Southern Baptist. That was my upbringing to a large degree. And I knew God could heal. I knew that he did heal at times. I just had no clue of how to get him to do it. And so I went. Uh, by that time, I, was, I also practiced and taught martial arts and went out and started teaching martial arts after I got out of the military and knew I was called to preach but didn't know how to go about getting started. And I would do whatever I could. I would testify and different things, but nobody was asking me to preach. And so I taught martial arts for a living and went over to a student's house one day, which is where I met my wife. He was dating her sister, and we went out on a date. Six months later, we were married, and within a year after that, we had our first child. When we had our first child, she, everything was perfect with the pregnancy and everything, no problems. When she was born... Uh, they had done, they had, had several sonograms done before she was born and could see no problems. But the minute she was born, there was a tumor in her tongue that was about the size of my fist. And it was very horrible to look at, and it was called a hemangioma tumor. And a hemangioma tumor is a tumor made up of blood vessels that are all together like a ball of twine. And they're all wrapped in. Now, the bad part is they tie in to the major blood vessels 
when they're like that. So if you try to cut it out, they would bleed to death. Doctors told us if we lived ever lived more than five minutes away from a hospital, if she cut her tongue, she'd bleed to death, and nothing we could do. She did several times cut her tongue. We would put a uh, cold wash rag on it and start praying in tongues and head to the hospital. And by the time we got there, three different times, by the time we got there, it was healed up, and there was no, all you could see is like an old wound. So we saw God work miracles there. Now, immediately when she was born, that got me to searching out healing. So I started, I, I went to everybody. I, anybody that talked about healing, I went to them. I studied under them. I, I did everything they said to do. I had all their tapes, all their books, everything. I sat under the very best in the world on purpose. I quit jobs and moved across country and moved my family and everything just to find truth. Well, <clears throat> over a period of time, the doctors also told us, you know, various things. They said if she ever grew teeth, that she would bite into it and she would bleed to death, which she didn't. She grew teeth and she could actually eat food, which was amazing in itself. She had a tracheotomy that she had to use to breathe. My wife had to go through nursing school to learn how to do all this stuff for her. Uh, she was in intensive care for six months. My wife had to live in, a, uh, in the hospital waiting room with two chairs pulled together for six months, sleeping there. And during that time, I, I was having to work, but I would go there on the weekend as much as I could and stay down there as long as I could, and we would have to sleep there in the waiting room because we didn't want to be away if anything happened. And there were, I don't know if a night went by that somebody didn't come running out screaming and just dropping on the floor and beating their fist on the floor because their baby had just died. And so we saw that, and then I heard those, these mothers and, and sometimes fathers cursing God and saying, why did you take my baby? Why did you do that? And, and I didn't know truth, but I knew that that wasn't right. right. And so we kept searching. As I said, got all set on the best, got all the healing teaching I could find. And I kept hearing about these guys and these people, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Simple McPherson, uh, Jack Coe, you know, A. A. Allen, and John Lake. And of all of them, they were all pretty fascinating, but out of all of them, the one that got my attention the most was John Lake. And mainly because if somebody can do it, that's one thing. But if they can teach other people and the other people can do it, that's something totally different. Because <clears throat> sometimes you do something, it's just a gift. But when you can teach other people to do it, then it's no longer a gift, it is truth. And so... I started searching out about John Lake as much as I could and come to find out he actually had passed away in 1935. So I found his family, started talking to his, I found his daughter, Gertrude, who was still alive, and her husband, Wilford Wright, who was also still alive at that point. Now this was, by this I'd searched for all of them, tried to find as much as I could about them. I uh, started calling them on the phone, everything. Well, <coughs> Roughly about two years after Erica was born, on Friday the 13th, February 1981, she passed away. We were getting results. Her tumor was getting smaller. Uh, we, were, we were winning. We just didn't win fast enough. And we buried her the next day, which was Valentine's Day, February 14th. And when we they, they buried her very quickly because of her tumor. They were afraid what it might do. They, they, asked, they told us they, can, they could cut it off, which would allow her mouth to shut and it would be normal, but they were afraid if they didn't do something that after she'd been dead so long that it would be a mess. It would not be good. And we said, no, she's going to be buried the way that she lived her life. Well, in... I'm trying to see, I got this, yeah... We had my wife's grandmother made this little bonnet and it had buttons on the side and then they made this thing that you could actually put her tongue in that was in front of her mouth because you couldn't go out in public because every time you did, people act stupid. And, and I understand. I mean, it, it scared them, literally. And so we had to do that, but we also had to keep it wet because her tongue would dry out and crack and bleed. And so we were going through this. 17, 18 years old. That's not the way a 17, 18 year old should have their first child. And so when she passed away, we were at that funeral, we're at the graveside actually in McKinney. <clears throat> and I stood at that grave and I said, God, because I, I called everybody, all these guys that I had their tapes, I called them, every one of them. Couldn't get through to one of them, not one. 
None of them would take the call. I got their secretaries. I got different people, but none of them would talk to me, which upset me greatly because they were talking about healing the sick and raising the dead. And now when I need it done, they were nowhere to be found, but they were sure quick to take my money, you know, for the CD or not. Back then it was tapes, cassette tapes and stuff. So I wasn't happy. So when I stood at that grave, I said, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me, I will be that man for somebody else. Well, they put that little white casket down the ground. They covered it up. And I continued searching for the truth about healing. That's when I got a hold of Gertrude and Will. Started asking them questions, details. I'd call them every Monday. Have this list of questions. Will would answer them. And then by, I would spend the whole week going through the Bible. And I'd say, what did John Lake believe? What did he, how did he pray? You know, I wasn't asking about his anointing because I figured I had no, nothing to do with that. I, I couldn't make the anointing work. So I didn't care about that. What did he, I wanted to know what he knew. What, how did he preach? How did he pray? What did he do? What did he teach those people that allowed them to be able to do what he did? 100,000 healings in five years. That's pretty good. And so they would answer the questions. I'd go through the Bible to all that week finding out whether what they were saying was Bible or not. By the next Monday, I had a whole new set of questions. So I'd call again. Well, this kept up for about seven years. <clears throat> Every Monday. I, my average phone bill, now this is from 1981 to 1987. My average phone bill per month was $400 a month. Right? Now, I didn't have it. I mean, literally, we were broke. And, but yet, I had to have answers. And so we were always, whatever we had to do to pay the phone bill, that was the one bill. You know, we might sit in the dark, but we're going to have a phone, you know. So we kept searching. Well, eventually, he kept asking me all these questions. And so finally, I, I, I told him, he said, well, what's your testimony? And I, I gave him my testimony. He said, okay, yeah, okay. He said, uh, what day did that happen? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I never asked my mom what day I got ran over. And he said, well, can you find out? I said, well, I can ask my mom. He said, find out let me know. So I called my mom and said, Mom, what, what date did I get hit with the car? She said, September 16th, 1960. I mean, that quick. She knew it. You know, you remember dates like that. And I said, okay. So I called him back and I told Will, I said, she said it was September 16th, 1960. He said, yeah, that's what I thought. And I thought, what do you mean that's what you thought? <laughs> Why would you think that? And he said, well, he said, there's been a, he said, in 1934, May 24th, 1934, about a year and a half before John Lake died, he gave a prophecy. And he said, in this prophecy, he detailed who would pick up the ministry, who would carry it on, and who would basically continue the ministry. And he said, and he started giving the details of it. Well, one of the details was that this person would be born the year the country, the United States, quit growing. Well, obviously, it's never quit growing population-wise, but the last state was added to the Union in 1959. Well, that's, I was born April 1st, 1959. Well, then he also said that this person, that Satan would try to kill this person 25 years to the day from his death. Now, he was prophesying this a year before his death. He didn't know when he was going to die, obviously. But... If you add 25, he died on September 16th, 1935. If you add 25 years to that, that comes to September 16th, 1960, which was the year that I was hit by the car. So everything lined up. Because of that, he said, I'm going to send you some material. I've got letters. I've got photos. I've got diary information. I've got all, this, uh, all these sermons, everything by John Lake. And he said, I'm going to send it to you because we're, we're going to pass the ministry to you because you're the person supposed to pick it up. Well, obviously it was a shock to me because I wasn't seeing really any real healing <laughs> at that point. And so I started getting all this material and he also gave me a list of about 100 names of people that had worked with Dr. Lake, been in his church, had been divine healing technicians trained by him. And so I started searching all these names out, where they lived, what was going on. Most of them were already dead. But then in 1995... I went down to near Houston, Texas to hear Pauline Parham preach. Anybody know who Pauline Parham is by any chance? No? Okay. Ah, you're all in sin. Anyway. <laughs> Everybody hear of Charles Parham? 
Okay, Pauline Parham was Charles Parham's daughter-in-law. And so I went down, he was one that started the Pentecostal movement in 1901. So I went down and listened to her preach. While I was there, I found a name in this list of people that was in, actually in Houston. So I went over to this nursing home and found this woman. She was still alive. She was in her 90s. And I went in and started talking to her about Dr. Lake. And I just started asking her the same questions I had asked everybody else. So after a little while, she got pretty upset. And I just wore her out, basically. And finally, she said, well, if you just had a manual, all your questions would be answered. And I said, well, that'd be great, but where would I find one of those? She said, well, I've got one. You know, and I felt like, <laughs> you do? <laughs> can I see it? And she said, well, you can see it, but you can't have it till I die. I said, okay. So I got to look at it, and I made as many notes as I could, but then I had to leave, so I couldn't do much with it. So then I went back home, and I started praying. I said, God, she's really old. <laughs> I'm just, now, I know you wouldn't have done that, but I needed information. Okay? Lord, she's lived a good long life. Lord, she's in her 90s. Lord, you only promised us 70. I mean, I was, I was pulling off stuff. So it took me about two years to pray her to death. So <laughs> the prayer of faith works both ways. Okay? <laughs> so we, um, roughly two years later, she passed away, and her family sent me the manual. So I started going through it. Well, immediately, I mean, like I said, I'd studied the best. I'd studied under the best. And when I started reading this manual, every, it was amazing. It was exactly the opposite of everything I'd been taught exactly the opposite. That's why I tell people now, if you want to do Bible healing, take everything you've learned and do the opposite. <laughs> you will be closer to Bible healing. I, I know that sounds strange, but I'm telling you, we have what I call the backwards church. We do everything backwards. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we'll, you'll see that as we go on. Well, over the period of time, I began studying. We began praying for people in our home. Immediately, my success rate went up to over 50%. Immediately, I mean, just by changing the way I prayed. And then we started going out and ministering different places. And when I say that, when I, nobody was asking me to preach. I was going to the hospital and praying for people. I was going to nursing homes and praying for people. And there was a, some people we knew, this one guy that played pool for a living. He, in other words, he gambled. He would go to the bars and he would hear about somebody that had a problem. And he would say, hey, okay, well, let's, let's take a run over to my friend's house. And he would bring them from the bar to my house bring him in my living room, we'd pray for him, God would heal him, and then he would run back and finish playing his pool game, and he himself was healed of mercury poisoning, right? Totally healed, and still gambling, still making his living playing pool, all right? So I'm not trying to give you a new theology or anything, I'm just saying, I'm just telling you what happened, all right? I didn't agree with it either, but I wasn't the one that did it, you know, so I wouldn't even argue with the fact that he got healed. Well, so we went on, and over a period of time, began praying for more and more people. And over nine months that we prayed for people just in our home, every person that came to our home was healed, 100%. Now, sometimes it was instant. Sometimes it took two weeks. Sometimes it took almost a month. They would keep coming back. We'd keep praying. But every person got healed. And it didn't matter what they had. It didn't matter, matter the disease. It didn't matter how long they had it. Nothing mattered. Amen? Now, what I learned, matter of fact, if you have any books by John Lake or about John Lake with his sermons, one thing you'll see is that in those books, they always say edited on the front. Well, what I found out was the parts that they edited out was the parts in this manual. And the reason they edited them is because what they took out didn't match the theology that they were preaching. And so the people didn't want to. See, that's why you like dead people, because you can control what they say. See, when Wigglesworth was alive, nobody liked him. He was mean. He was rough. I mean, he, he was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like him. And Dr. Simrall said every time he went to his house, he never found anybody there. You would think there would be this line of people, ministers, out the door. He said, never. He said, I'd go over, I could talk to him anytime I wanted to. Why? Because people didn't like him. Now, they would invite him to their conferences because he worked miracles. But other than that, they wanted nothing to do with him. Why? Because they didn't like him. Because he was so rough in the way he handled people. And he would tell, people would tell him, I mean, you, you know the stories, punching people, 
You know, I mean, there's all kinds of stories about different things like that. And one man he punched and the man fell down and the doctor that was with him said, you've killed him. You've killed him. The, the family's going to sue you. you. Now you've killed him. Look what you've done. And Wigglesworth just walked off and said, I know my business. And just walked off. And the man, after a few minutes, jumped up, healed. And then ran, and he had on a uh, hospital gown, you know, the kind that's open in the back. <laughs> and he was running down the aisle behind Wigglesworth, yelling, I'm healed, I'm healed. Wigglesworth, now this is the main thing. Wigglesworth never turned around, never looked at him and said, glory to God, yeah, you see, I know my, he didn't do that. They said, the man was running behind him, yelling, I'm healed. Wigglesworth never looked at him, never stopped, just kept praying for people, and went right on, never paid any attention to it. Why? Because it didn't surprise him. You understand? We've got to take healing from events to lifestyle. You, you've got to get... See, if you're surprised when they get healed, it wasn't your faith that got them healed. You understand? You've got to realize, you've got to get past that point of being surprised. You've got to expect... You've got to be surprised when it doesn't work. Amen? We'll give you some testimonies on that. Um... Just to show you real quick, and then I guess that was my daughter. You can see this. That was her tongue. You understand? Um, this one is a little more drastic. This is actually, this was the Christmas before she passed away. And you can probably see it from there, but that was her tongue. There, right there. So it was as big or bigger than my fist. You mean? Now, so if you have any question, as to why I hate sickness and disease. You just look at that right there. Because you know I if you can look at that and not learn to hate sickness and disease, you're already dead and don't know it. If you, if you think you have a problem with sickness or disease or something, but it's not that big a deal, go hang out at a children's hospital. And if it doesn't break you up, then you, you, you do not have the Spirit of God. Simple as that. Because it is, God's Spirit, I'm telling you, is greed over what the devil does in people's lives. And you have to learn to hate it. Amen? Well, I think we're just supposed to love. You can't love without hating. Do you understand? Jesus said, don't say you love me unless you hate your parents. Remember that? Don't say you love me. You, you, can't, you can't love both. You can't love everything. You got to love some things and hate some things. When it talked about Jesus specifically, he says, because you have loved righteousness and abhorred evil. You get that? Our problem is we want to get along with everybody. We want everybody to like us, and we want to like everybody, and we just want to be new age hippies. You know, just love and peace. Okay, that's not Bible. Jesus said, and see, I've had people say, well, you shouldn't say things like this because, certain things, because, uh, you know, you're bringing division. Good. That's what happens. Truth divides. Everybody doesn't want truth, and you're going to have to decide what you want. Amen? You're going to have to decide. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. He said, I came to bring a sword. And I will divide a family. Isn't that right? See, these are scriptures people don't remember because it's never preached on. But you need to realize, he came to divide certain things. He came to divide sin from righteousness. And so, you say, what does this got to do with healing? Everything. Everything. Now, 